Good morning to all. Eh, bienvenidos, bienvenidas, bienvenides. This is the Puerto Rican and Latino Studies 2105, New York Latinx Culture and the Arts, West Side Story, the Brooklyn Connection Lecture Series. This session is being recorded, so please keep that in mind. Um, and uh, I am Dr. Maria Perez y Gonzalez. I am the Deputy Chairperson of the Department of Puerto Rican and Latino Studies, PRLS, PEARLS. Uh, and for my students, please direct uh, message me in the chat that you're here. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying that we acknowledge that this is the unceded territory of the Lenape indigenous peoples. We need to learn about and commit ourselves to beginning the process of dismantling ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and to recognize the hundreds of indigenous nations who continue to resist, live, and uphold their sacred relations across their lands. May we remember to uplift and honor indigenous ancestors each and every day. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to acknowledge uh, very quickly, uh, Matilda Nistal is with us. She designed the beautiful flyers. Uh, and Alex Suarez, our tech assistant, uh, thank you both um, for contributing in this very special way uh, to this series. This Department of Pearls course is offered as part of the Intercultural Competency Rubric in General Education at Brooklyn College. The focus is West Side Story, The Brooklyn Connection, which I am teaching uh, with the centerpiece being the lecture series, which Dr. Sanchez Coral uh, made possible. And I will introduce her in a bit. This course centers the 10-time Academy Award-winning film from 1961 as connected to the forthcoming December 2021 release of the version produced by Steven Spielberg, Tony Kushner, Christy Makosko, Krieger, Kevin McConnell, and Rita Moreno. Our course explores the artistic and cultural impact of West Side Story through the lenses of the humanities and social sciences, highlighting topics of Puerto Rico's history with the USA, immigration, ethno-racial relations, gender, gangs, language, music, character analysis, and the like. Professor Emerita of Pearls and recipient of the 2020 Herbert H. Lehman Prize for Distinguished Service in New York History, Dr. Virginia Sanchez Coral, served as historical consultant to West Side Story 2021. And she is the Brooklyn College Connection. Together, we've organized a lecture series of special guests connected with the film to share their expertise, experiences, and insight for students as they move through the socio, historic background, and artistry of West Side Story. She is my co-host and chaired the Department of Puerto Rican and Latino Studies from, 18, from 1989 <laughs> to 2004. <laughs> and was founding president of the Puerto Rican Studies Association. Her numerous publications include From Colonia to Community, The History of Puerto Ricans in New York, and the three-volume Latinas in the United States, a historical encyclopedia. Her forthcoming 2021 co-edited book, which we partnered together to produce, is entitled Puerto Rican Studies in the City University of New York, The First 50 Years. And I'd like to take this opportunity now to show you uh, the book cover design. Um, and it's forthcoming in December. So I hope you can see that. Um, and uh, in conjunction with that, just so that uh, you know, I'd also like to share with you um, that the screen, the virtual screen behind me, Making the Impossible uh, Possible, the story of uh, Puerto Rican studies in Brooklyn College. That's my virtual background. Um, it is a documentary commissioned by APRE, the Alliance for Puerto Rican Education and Empowerment, which consists mostly of the founders of our Department of Pearls um, 52 years ago already. Um, and the documentary is making its rounds. The film is doing so well in all the festivals. And they have an upcoming event December 2nd, uh, so I will definitely, you know, send you an email about that information, but it's December 2nd in the evening at 6.15. Uh, so I hope that you join them in the screening of the film and in discussing it with um, 
Brooklyn College professors, founders, the producers of the film as well, uh, and APRE members. So uh, welcome. And some of them are here with us today. Some of the uh, alumni founders, student founders of the department are here with us today who commissioned the documentary as well. So congratulations to you. Uh, and it tells a beautiful story of student struggle and strength and what you can do in solidarity with peoples all across the board. So um, I, I wanted to really mention that and, and make sure that that got announced today. Um, as the talk goes this along, I'm sorry. I just, just wanted to say hi to everybody and that I'm glad that you're joining us this morning. Yes, and if you have any Q&A, right, uh, Q&A will happen at the end or towards the end, but please write your questions in along as you go along, right? Uh, write it in the chat as we go along, and, you know, we'll make sure to pose them to our distinguished guest. And so along those lines, today we have with us uh, a very special guest, Mr. Victor Cruz. He was born in Portsmouth, Virginia, and raised in the heart of the South Bronx. At the age of 16, Victor performed stand-up comedy for the very first time in New York City. He studied art and musical theater at Talent Unlimited High School and attended the Acting Conservatory at SUNY Purchase College, where he received a BFA. The day before graduation from the program, he booked his first TV role on HBO's The Sopranos. Victor has appeared in over 50 TV shows, films, and commercials. While pursuing his acting career, he produced his own content from sketches, short films, comedy shows, and features. Some of those projects include The Victor Cruz Show, a comedy sketch DVD, so go check it out, Victor Cruz's La Operación, a short film, Congratulations, Mr. Gonzalez, another short film, The Stock Room, feature film, and I think he's best known for Tita, the animated series. If you have not seen Tita, you're missing out. Check out Tita on YouTube. And so uh, we look forward to discussing Tita with uh, Victor Cruz today. Um, and so he uh, also runs his own acting studio in the Garment District in New York City, the Victor Cruz Acting Studio, and is on the faculty at HB Studio. Some of his TV and film credits include The Good Cop, Blue Bloods, The Other Woman, and West Side Story 2021. So you'll see him in there when you watch the film. He served as one of the dialect coaches on West Side Story 2021 and worked closely with Maria, Anita, and the Sharks on the Puerto Rican accent and dialect in both English and Spanish. He is currently voicing the character of Frankie Fourfeet on the new PBS kids show Alma's Way executive produced by Sonia Manzano, who was Maria on Sesame Street for a very long time, for decades. And so I did have a chance to see Alma's Way. It's beautiful. If you haven't seen it, check it out. And so uh, with no further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Victor Cruz. Okay. Uh, first of all, before you introduce him, I wanted to come by and say hi to everybody. Okay. You know what? I can't believe you're here. What are you uh, doing here? Hello, uh, I think Victor was coming. Yeah, no, because what happened was, okay, you know, I know he was going to be here, but, you know, I just, I, I needed to say hi. And plus, me, I'm really excited about the, the West Side Story Theater because, you know, I, you know, I actually auditioned for that movie, but, you know, Steven Spielberg, he didn't pick me. I don't know why. I auditioned for... The role of Anita, and, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I look exactly like Rita in the original, so I, I don't know why, why he didn't pick me. But, uh, you know, I went in there, I did all the lines, you know, I was like, ah, I want to live in America. Okay, but be in America. I mean, I, everybody says I sound like an angel when I sing, but... Uh, Absolutely. You know, I agree. <laughs> but but, I, but I, don't, I don't understand why you didn't get the role. I don't know. I can't. You know, I, I tried to I tried to call Stephen, but I, he didn't pick up his phone. And también I was calling Tony Kushner because I was like, "Mira, all right, Tony, I know you wrote the script, and I love Angels in America, pero how come you guys didn't pick me?" And, and, and he tampoco me, me contestó. So, anyways, whatever. You know, so I figure, let me come by and say hi to my homegirls here. Mira, by the way, thank you for having Victor. That's really nice of you guys. <laughs> it is well, our we're, pleasure. We're, we're, we're really happy that you're here, but that, you know, that's, that, 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 that bothers me. 
offends me that they didn't even get back to you. Es una falta de respeto. Es una falta de respeto, seriously, because, you know, I, I, I really prepared that safe. I think I was submission number 12,625. Maybe, did you do it on a video or did you do it in person? When I, I showed up to the studio, I did it outside. I'm sure they could hear me because, you know, they, I mean, I went right behind Lincoln Center because that's where the story takes place, right? Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. right. And they didn't hear you. Oh, so you didn't actually meet them, right? You were no. behind the building? Yeah, I went you? over there where they had knocked down all that stuff. Those poor kids, where were they going to move to? So I figure if, if the story takes place here, then that's where I got to come to to audition. But I didn't see Steven. I didn't see Tony. I don't even know where they were. I, 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 I still think it, well, well, maybe you should have written to them and or maybe sent them a video showing that you were singing, I want to live in America. I want to live in America. Hey, maybe I should have done that. Maybe I should have made a video and sent it to them. That's that 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 would help. That that I think that would have helped. I I I wouldn't feel too bad about that because, you know, maybe they just didn't get to hear you. I thought the sun just come around you, right? That. I, well, you know what? It's okay because you know what I hear? I hear that okay, every single shark in this movie is Latino. I, that makes me really excited because, like, I hear that they really went, you know, they went in and they did their research and they, you know, they brought in the right people to make things happen. And that makes me feel really, really good. So, you know, at least I try, right? Yes. That's and the important thing. I have a suggestion for you, Tita. You I mean, might, tell me. You might want to do a, a little episode on West Side Story and show them how good and talented you really are. So I think that might work. I mean, that's, that, you know, that's a really good idea. I could show them my version of it. I, you know what? I'm going to work on that. And then I'm going to send it to Steven and go, Mira, Steven, check me out, okay? You're not the only one that makes movies around here. <laughs> no, that's true. He's not the only one that makes movies around here, although he's been pretty good about it. What, like you said, you know, getting the Latino actors, and 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 it, it I think it's going to be a great film. But, uh, but but he has to understand that that there are others. You know, there are the fish in the pond. That's I don't know about Tony because Tony is, you know, he he gets he gets. Um, if you you say anything about his writing, he might get you know feel bad. That's true, you know, and I don't know if it was because he's from Brooklyn and I'm from the Bronx, you know, but, but we in Brooklyn College, so I know I'm getting a lot of love, so that, that shouldn't be the case. Everybody at Brooklyn College loves you. Right. I can tell you Stop that, right? It. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Brooklyn is well. down with Tita. <laughs> right, well, I love you guys so much. Thank you so much for letting me, you know, jump in to yeah. talk a little bit, but I'm sure you guys want to talk to Victor. Well, let me talk to thank yeah, you. Let's talk to yes, Victor. Thank you so much for coming, though. I really appreciate your visit. And on behalf of all of us, you know, palante. Woo! Hi, Nena, palante. Hi, give me a second, because you say, vieja, I don't know how to use these computers. Mira, Victor, can you come over here? How do they do this? Hi, let me find out where I can get him on here. Se fue. Hi. Hold on a second. Well, you know, somebody just wrote in and they said that Tita's a superhero. Oh, good. Well, I thank you so much, Ivan Dita. I really appreciate that. You guys are so sweet. I maybe I could get like a cape or something like that. <laughs> you, that's, that, that you should feel like that. I am, because you know, they got Spider-Man, they got Batman, but they don't got, you know, well, they, they do have Labor in Kenya. She's a Puerto Rican superhero, so I can't, you know, I can't take away from that. You know, she doing her thing también. <laughs> there can be one, more than one superhero. I, that's true, right? Yeah. Well, they can only, they can't just be just one Puerto Rican superhero. I could jump right. in también. And especially among women. Are you kidding? There's so many of us out here. Hello. Hello. And all the women in, you know, in New York City and uh, all the Puerto Ricans, those are real superheroes right there. <laughs> they could use the pilon as a weapon. <laughs> right? I, don't know that, I don't know that, I don't know that the Puerto Rican women today still use a pilon, but, uh, but 
Hey, hi. Hi. How are you? <laughs> how are you guys? <laughs> hey, how are you? You interrupted Tita. <laughs> oh gosh, let me let me bring her back. <laughs> <laughs> she definitely oh, has her moment to, to shine. Yeah. It's she even put her name you. on the screen here. Let me change it back to my name. She's very uh, funny. <laughs> yeah, they, they they anyone anyone who's tuning in now would look and say, wait a minute, who is this person, Dita? Victor, it's great to see you. It's great oh. to see you looking happy and excited about everything that's going on and, and especially to see Tita because that's yeah. she makes those rare appearances. I can't believe she didn't get a role in well, you know, she didn't exactly she didn't exactly audition. Yeah, she, she didn't went quite behind make it the too. building. She didn't know about that. Yeah. Um but um but we'll have to we'll have to help help her. We'll have to, we'll write to Stephen. <laughs> so, uh, and if Stephen comes on the program, I'm telling him right now, he's going to have to deal with why Dita was not even auditioned. I mean, but but you do have to uh, remember, right, that Tita's experience is similar to so many uh, of us who we don't know when these auditions happen, exactly where they happen, exactly how to do them, what to look out for. So, I mean, yeah. Tita's right. among the rest of us. So hopefully this series will help open up some of those doors and the possibilities and, and, and just about that. And not only that, but the fact that she has trouble getting around, you know, it takes her a while to get up and all that. That's important. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and 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 I'm here to support the senior vote on that. So, uh, Victor, how did you get involved in in all of this work? And I, I have some questions for you about accents too, but I want to hold that. One yeah, no, no worries at all. I um, th this was a, this was such an interesting dream come true because um, at the end of 2018, I went to see a play with my old mentor, my old speech and voice teacher from SUNY Purchase College. We went to see a friend that I went to school with. He was doing uh, Once on This Island. And afterwards we had dinner and we were just talking about, you know, just the acting work and sort of catching up on, on, on our lives. And then, you know, we were, he, he was aware of like, I, I was training actors and he was telling me what he was doing um, at Brown up in Rhode Island. And so he said, you know, maybe one day I can bring you up to Brown so that you can talk to the students and we'll figure something out, you know? And I was like, cool. And you know, sometimes when you, when you catch up with people and you have those conversations, sometimes nothing really manifests right away. Um, mm -hmm. And you're never sure like what will come of it. And, and literally like a week later, he called me and he said, Victor, I got this interesting thing that's happened. I'm, I'm doing dialect coaching on the callbacks for West Side Story. Um, and so this, uh, uh, my mentor's name is Tom Jones, uh, not, not the singer, but uh, he just happens to have the same name. And he had said, you know, I had worked on this project before, but they're bringing back for the callbacks. Would you be interested in coming on board since I don't speak Spanish, and more specifically, I don't speak Spanish with the Puerto Rican dialect, um, and I don't want to fake the funk at all. So would you come on? Would you help me with this? And I said, sure, absolutely. I mean, the idea to even just be in the same room as Spielberg and Kushner to help in any way, absolutely. So we spent a week with the actors as they were in the finals of choosing I didn't see Tita, so that's how I knew she wasn't, uh, she had not been chosen. But um, <laughs> most of the group that actually made the film uh, were actually there, with the exception of maybe a couple people here and there. And it was so exciting because there were a lot of actors there that had flown in from Puerto Rico to be at that callback. And it was, the, it was emotional for me sort of quietly by myself because I remember the original production and I remember how impactful and important that movie was. But I knew that every single person in the room was Latino, whether they were Puerto Rican, Dominican, Cuban, Colombian, it, it, every single person. And that was exciting. And so that was the beginnings of it. But I just helped with the callbacks. I had no idea that they'd want me to come back on board to actually help work with the actors, prep them, and actually be a part of the production moving forward. So that was a little bit of a surprise to me. I had no idea. So that is initially how I got involved with the project. 
<laughs> you know that that's that's more or less what has happened to a lot of us that are involved with this with this film. Uh, it's a random call, uh, someone that you speak to. It, it, it accidentally um, you you can't even you can't even put together a formula for if you want to get into a major movie. This is what you have to do because mm -hmm. it was all so random. I was invited to come in and give a lecture. Mm. I give a talk, not, not even a lecture, to give a talk uh, that first day. I was invited again the second time. Uh, the third time, uh, they offered me the opportunity to work with them. And uh, I've been in this business for over 50 years. And this was suddenly the highlight of something happening. And, uh, and I think I think it says a lot for the creative team and for the uh, and and for the the, the movie itself. Mm. Uh, I think that in many ways we're we're breaking new ground, uh, and I um, I'm I, I'm supportive a hundred percent of the of everything that they've done and the efforts that have gone into it. How did you get into to doing diction in the first place? And, and especially working on West Side Story when you talk about the Puerto Rican accent. Uh, yeah. There are so many Puerto sure. Rican accents. Sure. There's the accent of the uh, of, of Puerto Rican people who are born and raised in, in the US, New York. Mm -hmm. uh, the accents of newly arrived people uh, yeah. from Puerto Rico who would begin to to you know uh, use English on a, on a daily yeah. basis how did you how did you do that what what tactics strategies what did you tell the actors so you know in the very in the very, um, I pulled a lot of a lot of resources a lot of mm -hmm. you know uh, people just, you know, uh, whether they were in the entertainment business or they were politicians or they were boxers, I mean, sports, you know, I just, I pulled a bunch of different resources uh, so that the actors could just get a sense of the cadence and the musicality. Um, what was really helpful for me was that the script itself was translated by someone who is Puerto Rican. They also did their homework, did a lot of research to make sure that certain terms weren't uh, necessarily uh, too modern, uh, things that we had adapted by living in New York for so long. And so the script itself was a very good guide for me. Then all I had to do was check in to see what levels of Spanish people were speaking, you know, who spoke fluently, who sort of spoke it, but have lived in the States a little longer, who maybe didn't really know it. Um, because as I find, you know, younger generations that, that live in the States, they may not be speaking Spanish as, as often in, in the home, you know, because things have changed over time. So just figuring out who was who and, and what people were doing. And so when it comes to learning a language, I think any language, there's a statistic or a science broken down that basically says, if you were to spend one hour a day for an entire year and a half learning a new language, you could learn, you could learn, you can absolutely learn. Now that's one aspect of it. And once you learn it, you still have to hang out in the region, in the area in which that language is spoken so that you could then adopt the cadence and rhythm and musicality, musicality, which cannot be necessarily broken down in phonetics. Um, and so you have to listen to it, you kind of have to absorb it and learn it and spend a lot of time with it to really, really get it. And so I think that was how I sort of began. Um, there was also understanding how vowels are used uh, by someone who is just coming from the island or may have spent some time here and how we say words in English and how we uh, honor the vowel sounds in Spanish, which is how the accents are so beautifully created, you know. Um, 
we don't use diphthongs in Spanish, right? Like, like, oi, oi, or I, those different sounds. And so those diphthongs are then turned into a little bit of a shorter vowel sound. And, you know, so boy, boy, like we would jump right to boy versus boy, we wouldn't hang on to it too long. So understanding, breaking it down so that, that I could then sit down with the actors and say, instead of dance, we're gonna honor the Spanish A, which is the A, ah, I want to dance. And so that was the beginnings of sort of approaching it and baby steps because I didn't necessarily ever want to intimidate the actors, make them feel overwhelmed, because it was a lot to take in with a very short amount of time. And it wasn't just the dialect they were learning. They were learning, they were learning dancing and singing and, and so many things are being thrown at these kids. Um, but they, they honestly have done such a great job managing it all. Mm -hmm. did you how did you get interested in this field? And what, how, did you, how did you study it? Uh, this is something our students just have no no access to? Well, you know, um, I've always been a really great mimic. I've always loved sounds since I was a kid, naturally, organically. I was always recording my voice. I'd always make funny little sketches audio wise, playing different characters and different people in my own family, different levels of accents and New Yorkian, Puerto Rican. And so when I was in college and I met my mentor, Tom Jones, he, he quickly identified that I was a person that had a really good ear and sort of always encouraged me to bring a lot of my own culture to class. So sometimes, you know, I would do, you know, like sometimes I would just do like New York and characters in class and they would just talk or whatever, you know, or sometimes they, they might be like a little more nasal or sometimes I would just like talk like some people in my family would just sometimes want to do like voices and they would encourage that. And so I would have fun, have fun. And so while I was in college, I was also learning um, how to break down language. I also understood because when I first got there, believe it or not, I ran into an issue with one of my speech teachers. It wasn't Tom Jones, it was another woman who kept telling me something that made me feel uncomfortable because at the time I didn't know. She kept saying, I want to get you away from this sort of street thing that you do. And right. she knew that I, I was from the South Bronx and I kind of caught on to what she was saying. And so then I sort of responded with a bit of a smart answer at the time. And I said, well, don't you live on a street? And she says, yes. I said, I live on a street. And she says, yes. I said, okay, I guess we both have a street thing that we do. <laughs> <laughs> but, but on a positive level, what I did learn, and not so much from her, but from Tom Jones, was that it wasn't that he, and specifically, was trying to get me to stop doing what I naturally did, which was beautiful. And at the time, when you feel kind of alien, right? You feel like you don't belong in a space because no one is doing what you do. You suddenly start to question, is what I'm doing wrong? Is what I'm doing considered ghetto or la too Latino? It, the weirdest thoughts that would come to your mind, right? Because you don't feel like you belong. And what I learned was, no, you keep everything that is beautiful about you because there's nothing wrong with you. What we're gonna show you here is how to switch up things when it comes time to time to different characters. That's what it was about. It should have never been the stuff that the, that the other teacher was, was sharing with us, but, and, and my mentor and I recently had this conversation where a lot of those uh, systems with phonetics and, and how the speech work was originally created, it wasn't created open for all. And so they are, the, the work does have a lot of problems that now speech teachers are starting to now look and try to dissect and understand where the problems lie so that nobody feels the way that I do. And to answer your initial question, um, I had learned a lot of the work that we brought to West Side Story in terms of breaking things down phonetically so that the actors could understand 
um, what we were trying to get them to do in the movie. Mm -hmm. Did you find that the actors, where were they in terms of their levels of Spanish, right? Because sometimes, um, right, if you're looking for actors, um, many of us here have been here quite a while, right? Or we're born mm -hmm. here and raised here. Yeah. And so sometimes we start losing, right, the Spanish language and some of that, um, while others have come more recently. And so they're, you know, they have more of that knowledge. So how did you find the, the actors that you worked with? What, what do you say about their level and how hard they had to work or, or did it come naturally? For some, it, it was, it was natural, wasn't an issue. For some, it was a lot of work. Um, and I have to say this just up front to, to everyone who's here, every single actor, especially our leads who are in the film, have worked tremendously hard to arrive into a place as close as they needed to be, um, to where these characters are in our story. Um, for some, and I know this because of friends that I speak to, sometimes you know, um, Puerto Ricans feel a little intimidated if they don't speak Spanish, um, because once in a while people may say things that are harmful and, and they become very insecure, they, they get very shy about it. And so for those that weren't as fluent or not fluent at all, I was very careful, you know, with how I worked with them. I wanted them to know that I was in their corner the entire time, that I wasn't someone that was judging them mm -hmm. for not knowing the language because I too have experienced my own sort of internal issues in my own community, right? You're not really Puerto Rican, you're New Yorican or New Yorican. These separations, these conversations that I sort of grew up sometimes around and it didn't always make me feel good. So walking into this project, I knew that I would never make anybody feel uncomfortable. One, it wasn't where my heart or my mind was, and that was the environment I created. And I think they immediately felt safe and they knew, okay, I will work as hard as I can because Victor has created an environment where I don't have to feel bad if I ever did about not knowing or um, whatever the thing was for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to say that some of uh, some of our uh, uh, actors had uh, uh, also came with a very strong Spanish accent, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, um, where they were Spanish dominant and not English dominant, uh, right. and you could and and you could hear it immediately in their in their in, uh, in the way that they spoke English, uh, but um, so that we had it, it on on that set. Uh, so many different levels oh, of, yeah. of of language uh, that it was really interesting. You had to you you had to remember as you point out, you know what what stage they were at. But I I know that feeling that you're talking about uh, uh, when you're made to feel that you're less than because you don't pronounce words correctly and. And in my generation, of course, we suffered with that all the way through school. I could never say I, I could never say chicken. It was always chicken because that's how my mother said it. And when I realized that when I was made to feel that it was incorrect, it was wrong. Uh, my my resentment was was not at the person who was making me feel like that, but at my mother for speaking like that. And it was a very, very strange situation to grow up in. And I'm, I am, I'm really, uh, I think it was so important for me to try to get across to the cast, uh, not in terms of language, but in terms of who you were at that particular time. Sure. Uh, so that we're dealing with a period picture, a, 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 a movie that is 1957. Uh, everything about it is 1957 so that we we then also have to take everything that you did and put it back <laughs> into a time frame uh, and that could not have been easy yeah no, it was yeah it was uh it was it, it came with its challenges but i was so I, the, the this whole project has been such a blessing and i've learned so much too about our culture in terms of I learned even deeper things about 
you know, like how we pronounce things and why we pronounce them and when we get emotional, how we go back to, it's just such a beautiful thing, you know, mm -hmm. you sort of go deeper into the work. I wanted to share that my students, I have them do uh, vignettes, autobiographical vignettes or vignettes. Um, and sometimes they write about the language issue and pronunciation um, and parents, just like uh, Virginia just finished talking about. And you do, um, they reflect on, you know, yes, that experience of being sort of rejected for not knowing English well enough. Um, and then after a while for not, you know, knowing Spanish well enough. Um, and so, and, you know, who they sort of, like Virginia said, she blamed her mother, right? It's sort of like a, a, you present um, some of the sort of bad feelings get projected onto our own parents, grandparents, our own, you know, life situation and experiences. And so they feel this sense of, um, as if, yes, as if they're not worthy, right? And mm -hmm. one of the things that is so important in, in, in PEARLS, Puerto Rican uh, Latino studies, in ethnic studies, right? What the students, what our founders, students were fighting for and challenging was exactly that, that no one should be made to feel because of who they are and their experiences that they are not worthy. And so part of the reason for right, we, us existing as a department, as an area of study is because we need to, right? Because that beauty that we all possess that you spoke about, Victor, is something that we should cherish and our uniqueness should be cherished and our contributions are unique to this society. And how do we put that forward, right? How is it that we move that agenda forward? I think that's why Tita is important, uh, just to mention her again. Um, I'm because, glad you said that, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. because Tita, right, is in, in uh, she's older. She's definitely been in New York uh, for a while. But she is very Puerto Rican, very true to herself. And I, I think that's what's really special, right? When we find that place where we can say, yeah, we're part of the U.S. society. We helped shape and form U.S. society. There's nothing wrong with us. We are just who we are. We are unique. And that's the beauty of, of all of us, right? Sort of this mosaic that they keep talking about, this true diversity. They speak of it very well, but they hardly ever cherish it. So, right, part of what you know, you do in your work, what we do in Pearls, what ethnic studies does in general is to highlight people's beauty and contributions of, of who they are, right? To find a place in this world. How did you get into acting? Um, you know, for the me... Sopranos? The Sopranos? The Sopranos. The first, <laughs> the first you, got. you know, it's interesting. Uh, I knew since I was about... 11 that I wanted to be in the entertainment business somehow some way but I don't think I was quite sure how I was going to get into it and when I was about 11 or 12 or 12 drawing a lot of cartoons and my original dream was to make my own cartoon at a, as a young kid and um, that I was going to voice all the characters like Mel Blanc did on Looney Tunes mm -hmm. and um and that was my original dream. And when I was in high school, I, the art program that I was in um, was okay, was okay. I think it just wasn't grabbing or connecting with what I was doing. And I eventually sort of slipped over to the musical theater department just because they needed my help for something. And then one day, <laughs> and then the next day I was in musical theater and I was singing, dancing and acting, which by the way, had I not gone to that program, I would never have connected with the young lady at the time who later became my wife, oh, who's my go. wife today. Um, so, so I found uh, not just the love of musical theater, but, but I found my, my soulmate at, in that class. And, um, but, you know, when I was in musical theater, I also started doing stand-up comedy. I was about 16 years old and, you know, young kid at the club and, you know, they were still smoking at the bars back then. So by the end of the night, I had this huge headache, like I had smoked packs of cigarettes. <laughs> um, but but it, was, it was very clear to me at that time, being in musical theater and comedy, that I wanted to act. And I knew that I still wanted to make a cartoon, but I wasn't sure when it would happen. So I was sort of still hanging on to both. And then um, I decided to go to SUNY Purchase College after high school because I wanted to take the acting a little more serious. 
I had no idea what program, I mean, I, I didn't really know how intense the program was till I got there. And we had really long days and every day was just intense on just focusing on, you know, whether it was my voice, my diction, uh, movement on stage and the hours of these classes. You know, I remember hearing kids tell me like, oh, I got this paper to do. And I'm like, yeah, I got to roll around on the ground and roar like a lion. Um, I mean, I did take some <laughs> additional classes that I did have to take and write papers for, but it wasn't on the level of some of my, my, my buddies in, in school. Um, so ultimately, I think, you know, all of that just sort of made me say, I definitely want to be an actor. And then the day before I graduated, because uh, I'd started auditioning while I was in school and I wasn't supposed to. And I, I would always tell them I had to go see my allergy, uh, my doctor because of my allergies. And I had a lot of allergy problems in college, you know, was <laughs> constantly out of class because I had allergy problems. Um, and then of course, the day before graduation, I booked uh, the first thing I did, which was The Sopranos. And I said, man, this is great. This is happening. I mean, this is a dream come true, right? You go to school, you major in something and boom, you're already doing it. And I thought my career is gonna take off from here. And after I did The Sopranos, the phone didn't ring for like almost a year. And I was like, whoa, wow. maybe I should consider something else. And I literally remember sitting in my mom's kitchen and I was looking out the window and I was looking for a star that I could wish upon on. And then I saw a star through all the pollution. I saw a little star and I said, please help me help my career. And then the star started to move and I realized it was a plane, but it's fine. <laughs> I wished upon the plane and the rest is history. <laughs> and and the plane did not take you exactly where you wanted to be no so, no no twists so, and turns lots of patience so, so did you have to get a, 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 a how did you do it how, did you have to get an agent uh did you and and also then um when i saw you after the pandemic um and we were closed down for um almost a year and a half and and I I said how are you what have you been doing and you go the whole world has turned upside down what happened tell us how uh, that came about yeah so you know during during pandemic you know obviously the world shuts down and I'm trying to figure out what I'm gonna do you yeah. know and I'm sitting at my computer and I'm sketching because I never stopped sketching cartoons and I had this voice that I used to do where I would call and prank my actor friends, or sometimes I would call Ricky's around Halloween and I'd go, hi, mira, I'm looking for a costume for la nena. She wants to be SpongeBob. And, and so uh, and my friend would always say, uh, she would say, what do you do with that voice, Vic? You gotta like become that character. And I was like, I don't know if I wanna become this like, like live action. I wasn't sure. And so I'm sitting at my computer one day, I'm like, and I realized I've got this animation program sitting on my computer, just collecting dust. And I didn't even know it was there. And so I said, what if I animated this character? Could this be? And I had all the time in the world to do it um, with my kids climbing all over me. And, um, and so I, 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 made, I did some research. I found a couple of guys that could help me. Um, I found this fantastic animator out in Panama who basically like I designed the characters and then he then takes the designs and he rigs them up for me so that I can move them, manipulate them and do things with them. He sends them back and then I started animating Tita. And that was, you know, May 9th, 2020 was the first time the world met Tita on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and you've got the kids running around and hanging on to you. What did they say? What did they do about Tita, who now well, has taken your attention <laughs> away from them? That's right. So they want to make sure that they know that they are number one. So they would never, they would just be around me all the time. And um, I realized that they quickly became a real inspiration for the work. And I would watch how they responded to moments. And then I knew, okay, I'll expand on this moment because as kids, you just have to listen to them because they offer the very best and, and their responses are pure. They're, there's no holding back. If it's not good, 
it is not good. My daughter will tell me, dad, why did you take that out of the part? I love that part. That part was so funny. Put it back. And she gets real tough with me. She's like producer. She's my Christy, like on West Side Story in the house, you know? Um, you know, and so because of them, the show is a success. I make the show today for them. I don't even do it for the world anymore. Um, I still do it for me, but I, I do it for them now. Be very honest. And, and and you started the children's the ch reading the children's books for them. Let me tell you something about that. My wife is a teacher, the Department mm -hmm. of Education, and she's a uh, she's a special ed teacher, and uh, she had to do a series of videos where she was reading to the kids, and I was helping her and I was filming her, and suddenly one day she was reading a story, and and I started to laugh to myself. I said, "What if Dita?" read to the kids what would she do and so now the first two episodes i did of tita were under a minute they weren't very long so you know i tried to keep them short so people wouldn't get bored and i didn't want to do too much and so now here comes episode three and the first story that tita is going to read is goldilocks and the three bears now this video turns out to be six minutes long and i'm thinking to myself Oh my God, this is where I ruin everything. This is where <laughs> this whole thing that was very special yeah. for the first two episodes falls apart. I put it out there and I'm biting my teeth and I'm just like, gosh. By the next day on social media, I remember seeing Facebook. It was on Facebook and Instagram. It was like a 200, 300,000 views on Facebook by the next day. That even um, singer Domingo Quinones like chimed in and was like, Mira pa allá. Tenía que hacer una New York. <laughs> and he shared the video to all these people and people loved it. And so that was the birth of the storytelling, which uh, mm -hmm. if your students haven't seen it yet, they need to see a surprise mm -hmm. for Teresita read by Peter. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Virginia is the author of that book. So while she's a scholar, she has also written a children's book. And so, yeah, it's it's great. I got to see it and I, I really enjoyed it. So uh, yeah. congratulations to both of you. That's wonderful. Oh, I know that, that I saw uh, Tita for the first time. The Center for Puerto Rican Studies was having its Three Kings Day virtual festival. I tuned in and that's when I saw Tita and I said, <laughs> Oh, what have I been missing all this time? So of course I looked it up on YouTube and I saw it and and, and it was great. Um, my question is, so she's a woman mm -hmm. and she's in her 60s. So yes. a dress, I mean, when you create characters, right, whether in a film, a playwright, lo que sea, um, you do things intentionally, right? The creator. So can you speak to those aspects of it? Yeah, for sure. Um, so number one, my mom is my hero. We were talking about heroes before. And my mom is my Superman, my Batman, my Spider-Man. She was a woman that never, ever gave up on her kids, even when my dad was trying to figure it out. And I say that today because my dad was human and he made his mistakes while he was trying to learn how to do things. And so sometimes he wasn't always there. Um, and, he, and I know he was going through his own tribulations, but my mom was, was our hero. And growing up, I've been around so many powerful women that um, it, when I created Dita, it made so much sense. And I filled Dita with all of these things that I love so much, not only from women like my mom, my aunts, and my cousins, but women I knew from the community that if they saw your kid acting up, they would call the kid out on it and then they would tell the kid's mom. You know, so you, it was like, you got in trouble mm -hmm. twice. It was the old, like, it takes a village. Right. And so I think that represents that for me. And also for the first time I created, I created that I loved so much that it wasn't me sitting, trying to figure out a strategy. How do I get an audience? How do I connect with them? It wasn't like that worldly approach. I just decided I want to share something that I love without apology, without trying to have to explain myself. Uh, you know, I spent most of my time as an artist trying to fit in where I didn't always fit and ready to compromise sometimes to fit and be able to walk through that door. And Tita was the first thing that I 
didn't have to do that with, and I still don't do that with. And because of it, I feel so free and able to explore, you know, themes that are extremely important um, in our community and preserving some great things in our community. Mm -hmm. So you have to follow the passion. You have to. And I you think being the... honest and celebrate when you celebrate who you are and your culture, those things we talked about earlier about, you know, when you said the thing about the word chicken and you say chicken, right? And that that's how mommy said it. Well, there's something so beautiful that she did that. And at those moments, we don't see it because it doesn't fit in the rest of the world's perception of how you should say or live. But when you celebrate it, you can laugh at it, but you can preserve it because that's part of your growing up and it's valuable and it means something. And that's, that's what drives me to make Vita uh, in more episodes. Well, in the chat, Daniela Gonzalez y Perez asks, what's next for Tita? Is she moving to a TV network? Is that even something you're interested in? Absolutely. So let me say, because I started creating Tita, um, someone reached Tell out me. to me, a buddy of mine who's a writer, and he says, do you have a literary agent or manager? <laughs> and I said, I don't. I, and I was like, I think my agents for my acting, they have that department. So I didn't want to step on any toes. I said, well, let me, let me ask first, you know? And I asked, and I asked again, and I asked again, you know, it was really getting no response to this very special thing I created. And I just, I talked to my manager and they said, listen, can you find out if it's a yay or nay? Because somebody has reached out to me. And, and, and here was the one thing I missed to say was that my friend was like, because if you don't, my representation would love you, love you. And I said, okay, well, let me not step on any toes. Let me just find out. So when I found out that they were, you know, not interested at this particular moment, I said, fine, well, can I fly free? Because I've got someone that believes in me. And so I met with this company, this manager who is now my literary manager. Turns out she's Puerto Rican from Brooklyn. <laughs> and the president of this company is African-American. So when we're having a conversation in a meeting, I feel right at home because I don't have to really over explain anything. This woman knew exactly what this thing was. She goes, she talks just like my mother. She's yeah. my mom. She's yeah. my mom. And so the two of us were like, yeah. So they, they were super interested. And so the plan is to take this to network. The plan is to take to swing, to swing and, and, and aim to hit a home run, to fly for the stars. Because I said for myself, I've been doing things so independently for so many years why not give myself an opportunity to, to reach for the stars? You know, if, if everybody, worst case scenario says no, well, guess what? It doesn't stop me because I'm already creating the episodes. Mm -hmm. This is a bonus, but it would never stop me because right now what I'm doing, I'm extremely happy. So to answer your question, yes, network television is absolutely next. That is my plan. And what is next for Tita? I'm currently building, building a Dita Christmas special. Mm. It's titled The Year That Santa Skipped the Bronx. Mm. And this will be my first almost half an hour episode. And it's it's going to be filled with so, many, so much fun. Sounds good. Uh, wow. And I think Santa, <laughs> right, uh, might skip a lot of uh, places in New York City because we hardly have fireplaces. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So is it is it possible to ask, you know, for the writers and the listeners um, who that person uh, or that company is? Oh, uh, so they're they're called Artists First Management. OK, mm -hmm. I think it's really important just because so many young people don't know where to turn if they're good writers or good, even good actors, you know, what kind of representation they have no clue about sure. anything like that. And I, and I wanted to, to also ask you because you started, I saw you wrote some books and I know that when my eldest um, was looking and getting into acting and all of that, she was, I didn't know anything about, you know, how to guide her. And we looked for some books, but it just, and then I saw recently that you do have some books that talk about 
what to do, how to do it with interviews, auditions, that kind of thing. Can you speak to some of those how-to books? Because that's really important for our community. Uh, and especially if we want more diverse, you know, um, Latinos, Latinxes, uh, Black, Indigenous, Asian people, how do, you, how do you get into any of that? You need sort of how-to books. So can you speak mm -hmm. to that? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, having met Virginia, folks like Virginia and, and having like picked up her books and feeling really proud for her and her work and just, just that, wow, like we write books too. You know, it's interesting. You don't think, and there's so many amazing writers, you know, um, but growing up, I was just never exposed that we write books too. And so as you're saying that, I realize how important it is going to be for someone like me and others like me to leave behind material that can help guide and inspire. I wrote one book during pandemic and I did it because I knew that everyone was home and um, they had started doing auditions uh, just through self tapes. You know, nobody was going anywhere to audition. And to be honest with you, I think it has just changed the business in general that I think we're gonna live a lot in this space because it does save, I think financially, it saves money on casting directors needing mm -hmm. to rent a space and, and, and movie companies and TV companies having to set aside a budgets for that. So I wrote this book, How to Self-Tape an Audition, and it's on Amazon, um, which you can order it. Um, there is no audio version of it just yet, but, um, but at some point there'll be, there'll be more stuff for sure. And this book basically covers from beginning to beginning, middle and end, how to set yourself up so that your self tape is great. So that one, um, because you know, there are a lot of amazing actors, but if you don't necessarily uh, represent yourself in the best light, we'll miss some of those things. For instance, like your voice, you know, getting a microphone, a lavalier microphone that clips onto your shirt, that plugs right into your phone or into your camera so that even the most subtlest moments when you're speaking under your breath, that you could hear that. And, and you don't have to compromise performance because you feel like, let me try to accommodate the camera's microphone. Um, anything from how to light yourself. I talk about three point lighting so that I explain, you know, what a key light is, key light being the light that gives you the most light on one side and another light, which is called a fill light, which then fills out the other mm -hmm. side, but not as bright as your key light. And then there's a light that hangs sort of above you that's called a hair light or creates a, a hairline so that you really pop. And for anybody who's an actor and has done a self tape for themselves, they know that sometimes things look a little flat or shadowy because you miss that one little light that can help you pop forward. And so um, I, that book sort of takes you through, and it's a very short book, it's about 30 pages long, and it breaks down just step by step on how you can do this, whether you wanna use paper background or paint. Um, and also I, I share a little bit of my opinions about certain things. You know, you, you have casting directors that operate differently, so they'll have many different opinions. But ultimately in the end, you'll have to produce the self tape how you can produce it. You know, so though I give you all those lessons, you may not have the funding at first to get all of these things that I'm talking about, but I also talk about that in the book too. I say, just produce it how you can. And I even talk about just using natural light, like the natural light that's on me right now, that's sometimes, that's like the best light you could use for an audition. So I, I cover a lot of that in that book to help guide actors and, and young actors who are coming up and trying to figure it out. One of the one of the one of the great things. <laughs> Go ahead. One of the last questions. Um, you know, we have about ten minutes, so I'd, I'd uh, like for anybody to put comments in the in the chat. But one of the questions that comes up is, in terms of West Side Story, we've asked our other speakers to address this. When was the first time you saw it, and what was your response to it? <laughs> you know, I just saw it two days ago for the first time. <laughs> Wait a minute. No, I'm talking time. about the, the, the no, 1961. No, the, the, oh, 
Well, I don't think he was. Since you're not allowed to talk about this new version, it's about the 1960s. Well, well, I got really excited because I know you know Virginia had seen it, and I hadn't seen it yet. Yeah. But we're talking about the the original version, mm -hmm. um, of course, after the play. You know, I don't remember the first time I saw it. My mother was a huge fan of West Side Story. She had the right. original record. So when we weren't watching it, we were listening to it. And, you know, my mom was always singing it and sometimes imitating Maria and, and even imitating her dialect. You know, she would have fun with, with Natalie Wood's dialect. And, and I didn't know any, you know, I didn't think anything of it at the time, but it, West Side Story has lived in my house since I was little. There's one time I remember watching it as a kid and I remember thinking, that the movie was fun, but also as a kid, the movie is very long. You know, it was a very long movie when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, but, but to answer your initial question, yes, it, it's been in my house since I, I since I entered this this journey. <laughs> Practically everyone who's been on the uh, on the lecture series has has said that it has been in their house, uh, yeah. either through the music, or um, or or because the, they they've had the film. Uh, so, um, which is interesting to me uh, as a historian, because I think that the 1961 movie, uh, for those from my generation, your, your mother's generation, had such an impact on us that, that we didn't, we, we, we knew there was stuff wrong, but we knew there was stereotypes, but you know, that was Hollywood, what did they know? Uh, uh, but what was there was was solid, and 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 there we were, and we weren't we weren't killers and gangsters or dropouts or uh, you know every negative thing in the in, that, that you could think of. Uh, so it's interesting because uh, everyone has had the same reaction and opinion, <laughs> and uh, and I think it that's what makes it a classic. Yeah. And, and I think that it will continue to be a classic for the present generation and, and, and those to come. But um, uh, so thank you for, for that. And uh, do we have other questions coming in? I think we had a few that I had seen. From what I see here, no, we covered the ones that were here. Okay. Um, so I think we can give Victor an opportunity to you know, any, any thoughts, any comments? That you want to leave us with. Yes, and, and also comment on the 1961 diction, since you sort of mentioned it in your last response. <laughs> yeah, right, because my mom, my mom used to have fun with uh, Natalie Woods, you know, let it not be true, you know, let it not be true. That was her famous, like, impersonation <laughs> of Natalie Wood. And of course, she loved Natalie Wood because Miracle on 34th Street, and then later on, I you know, I fell in love with Natalie Wood because uh, Rebel Without a Cause, and so I started following her journey. But, um, you know, it's interesting. I had an interesting conversation with Rita uh, when we were, when I was prepping the actors, because her and I sat down to talk about what her dialect was going to be in this new film. And you could imagine that I was melting inside sitting there with Rita Moran I was like oh my god I have to I have to talk to her about dialect you know but it was so I was just like my god and it put me in a room with her and I'm just like this is Rita Moreno and and immediately immediately after talking to her for five minutes we felt like she's like a titi to me and we're talking and though you still have, you still have feeling of nervousness even with my own titties I feel like that because they're very serious but very funny but more serious you know and um when we were talking one thing that she told me was that um whatever dialect they were teaching them at that time they had brought in somebody and that it was a very it was very very strange dialect and and a lot of them just kind of just went with the flow because um it was, you know, it was what was being offered in the production. Um, you know, so when I want, then when I went back to watch the original film, I heard, you know, some sounds, you know, and I said, okay, okay, I can see what she meant and, and I'll do my best to stay away. I mean, obviously I was never approaching it from that place because I wasn't, I didn't know who, who did the dialect back then. And I was coming from a place of I'm bringing my my house, my community, to this space. So 
I never thought of anything other than as authentic as, as I can approach it. So um, I, I think it was helpful for her to say that to me because it was important to her. And there were some other things really important to her, you know, which she expressed and, and I didn't know, you know, and I'll, and I, maybe I can mention this as well. She talked to me how she felt about when they're putting makeup on her. And she told me, she said, I told the makeup artist, you know, Puerto Ricans, we come in all different colors. So you, you don't have to paint me this brown color. And the makeup artist looked at her and said, what are you, a racist? <laughs> and she then yes, said, I heard that. She didn't know, you know, at that time she was a younger artist, but she made it clear. She said, today I know how to answer that. <laughs> I know how to respond to that. So mm -hmm. a, a lot of our conversations also influenced, you know, how, how I wanted to just try to keep us as close as possible to where we needed to be. And um, I, I think the actors have worked really hard, really, really, really hard. And um and I think it goes all the way up to the leadership from Spielberg all the way down and the producers making it their absolute business to make sure that this picture was gonna be as close to authenticity as possible. And they didn't cut any corners. And, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really grateful for that. I think, I think Victor, one of the things that, that uh, has helped to bring us all closer together was the fact that the film didn't come out when it was supposed to, and uh, and with the with the shutdown and with because of the pandemic, um, we had an additional year to uh, you know pick up on little things that we wanted to go back to, um, and I found that of all the projects that I've ever worked on, this one had developed a feeling of camaraderie, of, of friendship, of closeness, where everyone from the most important Spielberg down to the least important person, no one was the least important person. Everyone, everyone had a stake in it and, and everyone was together in making this the best that they, can, they could do. Yeah. Uh, and, and I keep seeing that and feeling that over and over again. And I think that this lecture series, uh, if nothing else, has given our students uh, an inside look into, into the future, yeah. into the future, because this is opening doors and it is paving the way for so many of our kids. So, and, and you were there. So thank you for that. <laughs> and, Thank you. Uh, and all the, all of the encouragement that you gave me coming in. Uh, uh, of course, I mean brand you're... new. So and and Maria going along with us and wanting to do this course the way that that we've done it. So thank you for that. I also wanted to say thank you, Maria, and thank you, Virginia, for and, and the rest of you know uh, folks who were involved for having me come here because you know, I, sitting here, you realize how important, how important this is and this conversation today and just all the contributions, uh, that they never be forgotten. And thank you for having me. I'm, I'm beyond humbled and grateful for, for this moment, this moment. honestly. Uh, this is like so special to me. Well, and, thank you very much. And thank much. you for bringing Tita. Yes, thank you. Tita just hacked my computer. That's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> like a good Puerto Rican mother. <laughs> so thank you very much. And, and, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you, Victor Cruz in particular. We look forward to much more of your work and your creativity. And he's in uh, West Side Story also. Yes. He and has a role forward. in West Side That's Story. That's right. I look forward to seeing it. I'm the only one here of the three of us that has not seen it. And the rest of us, of course, are, are looking forward to seeing it as well. And so perhaps we'll have you back next semester so you can actually talk freely uh, about, about the movie. <laughs> Absolutely. You got it. Just so, let me know. Mil gracias. Thank you. And thank you all. And, and we are still trying to get, right, uh, Steven Spielberg, Rita Moreno, uh, to come and be with us uh, during one of these sessions before the semester ends. Uh, but our next scheduled event is December 6th with Janine Tesori, um, famous, oh, you know, award-winning oh. musical composer. 
And so, uh, once again, gracias, Mr. Victor Cruz um, and Tita. And uh, we uh, look forward to, to you know, uh, a brighter future for Latinxes in the entertainment industry, um, showing their authenticity and uniqueness. So, gracias. Thank you. Gracias a ti. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Be well. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>